Frank Miller knows what he's doing. Flick through any volume of Sin City and you'll see its genius spread across any page. He fully understood how to decode what comics are, or can be, or would be under his pen, and he attacks it on every page. Comics as a medium, they suffer from being a flat, two-dimensional thing. To work around this, artists can do all sorts of clever tricks, which I've probably covered in various forms at some point, but mostly they exist to create some sense of reality within the pages and the world. Vanishing points aim to create a sense of distance or scale, adding more than two dimensions allowed by a flat image. Colorists use contouring and colour holds and brighter and darker spots to add to that sense of distance or shape. Even letterers can use scale or placing balloons and sound effects behind objects to help show distance. And Frank Miller was able to do all of that in just black and white in Sin City, by looking at comics differently than just a way to recreate a world on a flat plane of the page, because instead he asked why. What are we trying to achieve by creating that realistic world? That's the same question asked for all mediums really, and for me it comes down to three things, mood, story, and theme. So Miller approached his work on Sin City, and increasingly on other projects since then, by spending each moment in the book building those three elements. Every image on every page is dripping with all three, and he does it through a seemingly simple choice of restricting and narrowing the style in which he's going to draw the pages. I think it's really easy to say Sin City's mood exists just because it's black and white, or because of the scratchy feel of the pen you can say it's gritty and leave it at that. But it misses the true beauty, and yes, genius, of how these books are crafted. I'm particularly going to look at that yellow bastard, and I will, as is often the case, stick to the opening set of pages, because that's typically going to be a reader's introduction into this world, so it, to me it makes sense to start there with us. First things first, let's look at this opening splash. It's made of three elements, moving from left to right. Before you get to those though, you're given the title of the book, and this may encapsulate perfectly what one of the tools Miller uses in the book is. It's stark simplicity. It's in your face, it's got bravado, it's large, it's extreme, it's not clean cut. And it doesn't have any superfluous detail. It's the words, the name of the title, in white on black. The title itself is as upfront about the content as anything else is. It's about that yellow bastard. And then we get the three elements, the construction and factory pipes that give us a sense of setting. The car, one thing that constantly occurs in Sin City, and the two characters that lead the narrative over the next page or so on the far right. Miller works in simplicity, and this is a straight left to right page, all on the same plane, dispelling little pieces of information that don't require much from the reader but to follow along. They're all separate, yet linked by the fact that they share that same page, dragging you along. And each element is an exaggerated form of itself in each instance. The factory chimneys and metal bridges and structures don't exist in any meaningful way as far as we can tell, they're just sort of a jumble and mess of forms that exist to create merely an idea of what they're conveying. The car is a muscle car, all curves and sleek lines, boldly lit all the way around it by a bright white light. You know, it's almost like the car of your dreams been lit in a showroom. And the two men on the right, one stomach flopping to the extreme or stumpy and short, each of his elements designed to drown him, the trench coat extending to swallow him up, his little legs unable to do much but kick up dirt as he's pulled along. And then you've got Hartigan, all brawn and stoic, dragging him along, fists clenched, unmoved by this other human clinging onto him. It's all ridiculous, right? <laughs> the scale between the items is a mess, the lighting doesn't really add up, it's all cartoony, even with the lettering and that large big no. But what it does is it pushes the story. We learn about these characters, about what Hartigan needs to do, and it pushes theme, an old man trying to do right in the world that wants to stop him, and it pushes mood, intense lighting, grave body language, sexy cars. So he's pushing everything to its extreme, and using the style of the harsh, blown out lighting as a way to facilitate it. His work in Sin City all becomes about form and light as a way to interpret the imagery he needs to convey. A few pages later, we see the girl Hartigan is looking for. Again, there's nothing in terms of background, you know, he's not using it to suggest location or depredation of a horrible environment she's in or anything like that. He's merely telling us everything through simple light and form. The shadow across the panel is evocative in itself, suggesting pure menace, unspeakable evil. It tells us so much more than who or where, concepts which actually become unnecessary at this point in the story. What it's about, though, is the fear of the girl. The second panel zooms in on her face. Again, no background, no real detail actually anywhere except for her eyes and mouth, and it's what we need to understand the mood, the theme, and the story. Her scared, young face. Any page you take from this book does exactly the same thing. It distills the visuals to their bare essentials. Each panel seems to be asking the question of, why do I exist? And what Miller does is drill down on that concept and deliver only that, nothing else. When Hartigan suffers an angina attack, the background drops out again. His face is hit with contrasting lighting, but his eyes are still visible, so we can see the anguish, the pain, the age sitting on his face, and of course that scar. His hulking body contorting. 
is telling you so much by removing anything that isn't important. And that's why Miller's genius shines through in this book, and it's why I'd label him as a minimalist, which is maybe not the immediate reaction you'd get from his exaggerated artwork. But again, what Miller does is understand the reason he's drawing these panels in the first place. He's in charge of directly communicating with the audience, and he really knows what's actually important in each moment, in each panel, with each line. Thanks for watching. Strip Panel Naked continues thanks to the support of people through patreon.com slash strip panel naked, where there's exclusive new content and articles every single week. Check it out and consider supporting. For more comics talk, you can find me on Twitter at Hasanoe. And finally, hit subscribe and that notification bell to keep up to date with all the latest episodes, and we'll see you next time.